to help you do this work? How do we serve as a resource, as a greater resource, to help you be successful? And so to help us set the table around that discussion of community partnerships is going to be Greg Darneter, who spoke with us yesterday about the landscape um, in, in, the, in the U.S. And so now in terms of higher education and education and so forth. And so I would like to have Greg come here. He's going to talk to us. I think yesterday you said you were going to tell us some stories from the road. Uh, and Greg, as we mentioned yesterday, is a special assistant uh, to college access uh, for the in the Department of Education. So, Greg, thank you. Okay, I'll start with the microphone this morning. Um, so, just to pick up on a couple things that Jeff and Jacob just shared with you, uh, not only do we have Higher Ed Act being reauthorized, but we also obviously have ESEA, No Child Left Behind, and the whole waiver process. Um, as Many of you might know we also have put out a blueprint around CTE and the redesign of CTE. Uh, the president's proposed a billion dollar investment in helping districts build career academies. Um, this would be above and beyond the 1.2 billion dollars that the department currently invests in career and technical education. So you know, we'll see where that, it's in his proposed 013 budget. So we'll see how that plays out over the next uh, weeks, months, uh, and, and the such in terms of the budget that's for this year. Um, so there's actually quite a bit of opportunity on, on the horizon, but there's also a major dark cloud. And then going back to one of Jacob's comments around federal aid and what 75% of or 77 percent here in, um, uh, of the aid coming from from us, Pell in the 014 budget, so not this current fiscal year, but the following year is projected to have a several billion dollar shortfall. So there are conversations going on within the nonprofit community. Gates has funded eight or ten entities to begin thinking about what that might mean. Uh, that could translate into a fairly significant cut in the Pell Grant? Could. Um, as you might know, the President's proposed an $85 increase in, again, his 013 budget, so not a significant amount of money, probably more symbolic, if you will, in terms of his priorities, of which he's made very clear and he's, you know, and he's defended the support of, of low-income students through the Pell program, um, and it not only defended that, but also, remember last July 1st, uh, Congress had to act um, on student loan um, debt per, um, interest rates not doubling on July 1st, and so he was able, we were able to make a, a deal on that. Um, couple weeks before July 1st sort of thing. So my point is that the President is, is going to be our strongest proponent in, in this kind of conversation around Pell, um, which doesn't, as you know, operate basically as an entitlement program. It operates as an entitlement program even though it's not labeled an entitlement program. So anyways, um, lots of opportunity, but also this fairly large dark cloud in terms of how, how does the shortfall get handled. Um, there are conversations around limiting Pell if students enter higher ed not prepared to earn credit. So if they're in remedial courses, should federal funds be used to support that? Um, um, should, they, should the time that they can be in remedial courses be limited? Um, those, those sorts of things. Now, some institutions across the country are making their own decisions along those lines, where if students are in remediation for half a semester, I mean, for a semester or two semesters, the institution is saying, it's not in your, we're not going to continue to enroll you, because um, it's not in your, you're na not making adequate progress, and our concern is about you uh, potentially absorbing more debt and the such. So, anyways. So, uh, yes, let me tell you some stories from the road. Um, let me put this in context. Um, there are five major areas that, from when we arrived a little um, less than four years ago, that have been core to the way we've approached 
our funding strategies. And these will all sound very familiar, and I'll try to refer to them, and the, most of them will be fairly obvious, obvious as I kind of share some, some of these stories. Um, so the first one is around leadership and teachers, so um, supporting high quality teaching and supporting um, school leadership. The second is around standards, and this is all related to the conversation in terms of um, what's gotten most people's attention across the country in terms of our, uh, the United States falling behind other countries in terms of you know, students' academic achievements or post-secondary degree completion rates and that sort of thing. The third one is around data and this kind of ruthless honesty about data. The fourth one, which was not part of our original core print, um, funding areas, um, is early childhood. And early childhood has emerged over particularly the last year as a centerpiece of our funding. And then the last area is um, really um, our civil rights, our social justice investment and, and kind of banner to say states and districts and communities need to pay attention to the bottom 10%, the bottom 5%, the dropout factories. You need to pay attention to the lowest performing schools in your state, in your district, the lowest performing students in your district, your state. Um, and so this has been part of our school improvement grant, the SIG grants. Um, um, it's been our major investment there. But it also comes through in our I3 funding, uh, in our Promised Neighborhood funding, and, and, and the such. So um, as I've um, shared with most of you, I think I've got the best job at the department because I report to Arnie, which means I, we exchange emails once in a while, and we sit down a few times a year. Um, I can get to him any point in time. He can obviously get to me at any point in time. But um, when I ran the high schools in Chicago, I had 200 staff people, and I had a $45 million budget, you know, and I show up at the department, and they give me an office, and it overlooks the Air and Space Museum, and I look to the right, and there's the Capitol, and I look to the left, and there's the Washington Monument. But I have no staff. I have no budget. I have, I have a job. I'm supposed to be the senior advisor. I am the senior advisor to the secretary on how do we get 8.2 million additional college graduates in this country. And, but uh, you get to sit in the secretary's office, which is great because it gives me access to all the different uh, assistant secretaries who are actually driving you know, the Office of Elementary and Secondary Education or the Office of Vocational Adult Education or to the undersecretary and her staff and so on and so on. So I think it's the greatest job in the world because I also only have to be in D.C. when I really need to, which means I can be out here with you guys and keep coming back to San Antonio, as, I, as you know I love to do. So, um, so here are some stories from the road, and I'll try to talk about those five core funding um, areas. Uh, let me just say that if any of these, these are just kind of meant to be, um, hopefully some of them will stimulate you. Um, if you want to know more about a particular uh, district or program that I mentioned, just come up to me afterwards. I'm happy to do an email introduction uh, and make that sort of thing happen. One of the things I just I love about our community, our education community, is a willingness to learn from each other, right? And we're all very proud of what we do, and we like to share it. And so the people that I'm going to talk about have just been so generous and open with, with their time um, with me over the last three and a half years. Uh, most of what I'm going to share has actually happened in the last couple months because the day after Labor Day, I was in uh, Seattle and then and sp have basically spent the last 10 weeks on the road, except for like two, three day stints back to do my wash in DC and then come back out. But it's been, um, it's been uh, really inspiring and quite motivating to, to just to see the energy that's out there in so many different contexts. So let me talk about, start on the pre-K side. Uh, we met, I mentioned this yesterday, how, how um, particularly in rural communities, how when you don't have a local foundation, you don't have a big corporation, you are 
And I'm talking about if you've ever been to North Dakota, where you can travel for an hour and maybe not even see another human being, you know, as you drive from one place to the other. But in, in places that are pretty isolated uh, from what we're used to living in ur um, urban settings. So um, Berea, Kentucky. Berea College, anybody ever been to Berea College? This amazing institution that doesn't charge tuition, um, serves 1,600 students a year. You have to live in the Appalachia area. Um, Berea College, in the last two years, has gotten more federal money from the Department of Education than probably anybody else, any other entity um, in the country. They've got the largest um, gear up money in the country. They have two gear up grants that total almost $50 million. They, they um, have upward bound programs through their higher ed institutions. They have a promised neighborhood grant serving half a dozen counties, rural eastern Kentucky, um, coal mining country, uh, not much around. Um, but this institution has this, these amazing leaders, underscore leaders, who have a vision for their young people. Um, one of the districts there, Hazard, has the school system made a policy in terms of this, how do we build this college-going, career-going culture within our, with, with our kids? So they did a very simple thing. They passed a board policy that said any field trip that start with second graders or older must incorporate a stop at a higher ed institution. If you want permission to go on a field trip, that's fine. But you just have to make sure you stop at a college or a training program. You know, now these are not large colleges. They're usually a building or two. Um, but what they're trying to do, obviously, is translate um, to these young people what the, why they're in school and what it can lead to and begin to build this vision and the such. Shasta County, uh, California, Northern California. Anybody ever been there? Kind of a gene has been there reporting. <laughs> so pretty I've never been there. But they um, decided as a community a number of years ago that they needed to build this kind of image of the importance of school with their kindergarten kids. And so they said, okay, we don't have any industries, we don't have any foundations we can turn to, but we do have ourselves. And so they started a career fair for their preschool kids. And what they asked was the, the community doctor to come with his white coat or her white coat and stethoscope. They asked the dentist to come, you know, with the appropriate professional garments. They asked the forest rangers, the, um, all these different professions to come kind of to illustrate just through their um, dress and to talk with these kids, but also to put on demonstrations of wherever they could. Well, this started with a couple hundred uh, people. It's now five or 6,000. It's turned into a day-long festival with free health screenings and dental screenings and fire demonstrations and, and all this, all focused around their four and five-year-olds to, to be, again, to build this image in these kids' heads of what can happen. Um, the creativity um, really hit me when I went to northeastern Tennessee. Rural Tennessee, a former superintendent, retired, had this vision of how do we really build rigor and college opportunity for our kids when I've got schools in, in rural Tennessee that range from 40 students, high schools, 4-0, to 2,000. Most of them, a couple hundred kids. So she, um, they actually ended up writing an I-3 grant to us and decided to use technology. And I wish I had thought of this when I was in Chicago because it was very similar to the challenge I felt um, in, in urban, many urban settings. So in her mind, it was like, how do I get physics 
delivered to the two kids in that high school of 40 students, right, with at the highest level possible. So she gathered these principals and superintendents. They built this um, proposal to us. And using the basic question was, who's the best physics instructor within our 27 high schools? Who could deliver five or six class periods a day to 25 or 30 kids every class period, three or four, five or six who are actually live in front of the teacher, and the others are basically on flat screen TVs um, uh, and de delivering the lessons. Uh, they've recruited three young ladies from China, so they're now teaching Chinese. Um, underneath all this was to build um, an AP strategy because they knew that um, with a fundamental belief that these kids, if they were given the opportunity, could do as well as any other child um, in Tennessee, if not the country, uh, and the country, but we just needed to figure out the delivery mechanism uh, to, to these kids, subject after subject after subject. In one year, their AP offerings went up fivefold, just because they figured out, you know, a way to collaborate and, and, work, and work together. Um, it's a remarkable, remarkable story in terms of, of leadership just stepping out there and taking the risk and the such. Southern Maine, Southern Maine Community College. Uh, we talked a little bit about advanced manufacturing yesterday in the 60 Minutes segment that was on Sunday. So they have this, they have this challenge in Maine where the community college president decided to begin to, to open up some of his shops, so the welding shop and the carpentry shop, to students who had dropped out of high school as a drop-in place without a pressure to get them to enroll in class. It was just a place to kind of hang out. The long-term intent is to get them to enroll, but the first line of you know, the attraction here is just to create a comfortable place for young men and young women just to come. And if they have an interest in learning carpentry or welding, hey, just come on over, spend a couple hours, blah, 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 blah. Well, something like 75% of the drop-ins to these shops end up enrolling. Those who enroll in their advanced manufacturing program are being taken out of that program, halfway, one year training program, being taken out of that program, um, halfway through it, by manufacturers in rural, rural Maine, because they're in such des in, in desperate need of, of, uh, of workers. Um, and then working out with the community college, a way for those students to finish their, their certificates and, and, and the such. So, in talking to the president, it was like, this is just the right thing to do. It doesn't cost me a lot of money, but it's, it's a way for me to, you know, to, to engage the, uh, the community in a very meaningful way. Um, CTE, let's go there for a minute. So I'm in Elk Grove, California, just north of Sacramento, and it's National Gear Up Week, and we're celebrating National Gear Up Week at Elk Grove High School. Anybody been to Elk Grove, No Elk Grove at all? Well, the principal gets up and his CTE director gets up and begins explaining some of the projects that the students will be doing this year. The first one was that the, the kids in the um, construction trade program are going to design and build a greenhouse and sell it to a family in the community. They, um, They've done this before. They have it, you know, they've got the architecture and drawing piece of this all together. The kids will um, actually build it, will actually meet with the lawyers in terms of the actual sale of the house to, the, to whoever ends up buying it. And I mean, just this very powerful example of translating um, meaning of school into, into action, if you will. Another group of kids at the same high school have come up with this idea of building a solar-powered battery 
that can be used in medical clinics in Africa. Now, where they got that idea and who, where they it got seated, I don't know, but they've done this. And they were actually at a point of talking about how do we commercialize this product that we've created as these 16 and 17 year old kids. And just the energy and kind of purpose and intent of why we go to school is just, you know, um, you, can't, you can't quiet these kids in terms of their, um, their inspiration and, and the such. One of, one of the, um, on the engineering side, uh, Project Lead the Way is something if you aren't familiar with it, I encourage you to, to look into. It's really spreading across the country. Um, it's a curriculum at the high school level. I think it's also down into the middle grades to some extent. But it's all around engineering. It's very project focused. It's very hands-on learning. Um, it's supported by professional engineering uh, associations and, and the such. So something to, to look at. Albuquerque. Albuquerque has just built a brand new high school serving about a 90% Latino population that is, I believe it's seven different programs of study. Each of these programs of study has their own building. Um, the county, so they have a school of law as one of their programs of study. The county has built a, a courtroom in, as part of this school of law with a full jury box and seating for, you know, observers and um, a couple judges gave the school their law books, retired judges gave the school their law. The county intends to hold trials there and for students then to have the opportunity to actually have hands-on exposure to seeing our legal system in action. The building next door, they are working with Disney to build an entire um, program of study around animation and with Disney's help. Probably doesn't get much better than that, right? But the vision of this principal in terms of, and she had a huge fight with her board in terms of why are we going to spend like 70 or 80 million dollars to build this state-of-the-art high school and this is on the outskirts, way on the outskirts of, of Albuquerque, um, to serve low-income Latino families. And her argument, Latino woman, is this, is this sure as hell would not be a question you would ask if this was being built in another part of our, of our city sort of thing. And so she's been fighting for years to make sure that this high school gets built, if you will, for, for her kids. Um, a couple weeks ago, the College Board had their uh, annual conference in Miami, so I went over to Miami-Dade schools. This was two days after they had just won the Broad Prize, so they were in a very good mood. Um, but <laughs> but uh, one of the things that Miami has done is use the, um, the uh, National Academy Foundation to build up their CTE Academy offerings in the district, and I believe I was telling Jean it, um, last night, I think they've got five or six of those 16 programs of study that, um, that, they're, that they're focused in on. So let me tell you about the most amazing place I've been to, Long Beach. Uh, anybody familiar with Long Beach's story? So you can correct me if... if, uh, if. So I'm, I'm, I'm typically the guy that's half full in terms of, the glass is half full in terms of... Um, of how I view these things, but this really got me excited. I was there um, just a couple weeks ago, and their superintendent's been in place for 11 years, Chris Steinhauser. Um, over those 11 years, and a few years plus, so his predecessor, this amazing partnership's been built between Long Beach Community College and, Long Be and Cal State Long Beach, which basically guarantees for every Long Beach student admission into Cal State Long Beach. Now, why is this amazing? Cal State Long Beach gets 60 to 70,000 applications for 4,000 uh, seats each year. Okay? 
60 to 70,000 applicants, 4,000 seats. They also admit something like 3,500 transfers from the community college systems and, and the such. Cal State Long Beach made a decision to set aside at least 1,000 of those 4,000, 25% of those seats, for Long Beach students. Now think about this. They, the Cal State Long Beach probably could admit 4,000 kids with 4.0 GPAs, right? But they have decided not to do that, now, to, not to do that fully. They're saying, we will take these kids from Long Beach I, ISD and guarantee them admission into our system. So why would they do that? Part of it is on a social justice and civil rights. Part of it is about seeing their future as a community truly, truly in the hands of their young people. And we're going to give our young people the best education possible. Now, if I'm the president of Cal State Long Beach, I'm not going to make that bet unless I also have confidence in the community college system and in what's happening in K-12, right? So Cal, um, Long Beach ISD has this long-standing superintendent. He just signed another four-year contract, he told me. I happened to be there when it was principal for a day, so I got to actually hang with the superintendent for, for a day as we popped into school after school after school. I didn't see one student not engaged, as, and we were popping into schools totally unannounced. He wouldn't even go to the principal's office to tell the principal he was there. He would just go straight into classrooms, sort of thing. We, I, we didn't see one student. We saw a couple thousand students who was not fully engaged in learning um, as we popped in and out of classrooms. So, so what, have they, what have they done? I want to use Jeff's example about algebra, but at the high school level. So they have um, offered high school algebra to their eighth graders. Something like 70% of their eighth graders take algebra, high school algebra, and 80% of them are passing it. Um, so they're basically addressing this transition academic rigor piece as early as possible to tell students, to seed in students, the fact that you can be su a successful high school student. And we're going to show you that um, as early on as, as possible. Um, he is a leader that has very clearly outlined to his principles, his expectations, in terms of what he expects those principles to put in place programmatically. And so that if you're going to, um, I know it's back over here, the Harlandale uh, has uh, implement AVID with fidelity, right? <laughs> so we like to talk many times about pr our programs, but we all know as administrators that it really gets down to this issue around fidelity, right? Um, we can design all the most magnificent tools and feel really good about our design, but if they don't get implemented, by those teachers in those classrooms day after day after day with fidelity, you know, we've, what, what have we really accomplished? And so this becomes as much of a managerial challenge as it is having the right tools in place. Um, I know going back to how we, we put together an electronic portfolio, portfolio for our kids in Chicago that started in um, fifth, sixth grade. The issue was, where does that fit into the curriculum from a time standpoint, right? Uh, when you go into the middle grades and talk to teachers and administrators about that. And so for administrators who really get it, that's a very short conversation because they figure out how to do it, right? For others, it's a much longer extended conversation in terms of, now why am I doing this? And and <laughs> do I have to? Yes. <laughs> and uh, and what, if, what if I don't? And, you know, all this stuff. But for administrators who really get the importance of it, it's not a conversation at all. You just figure it out. 
And you figure it out not by dictating it down. You figure it out because you introduce it to your staff and you figure it out together, right? And then it just gets done. And, and you figure out then how to, to monitor it. Um, I had a quarter million kids across 650 schools that I had to try to figure out a system to monitor it in terms of, of the implementation and fidelity of just that one tool. You know, we had Avid in 250 schools, um, had about 40,000 kids in it. How do you monitor the fidelity of implement, implementation on a consistent basis um, and the such? And of course, data helps with that. Um, um, and just having, having the right staff to oversee it and are able to, to interact appropriately with uh, administrators and teachers is, is critical uh, as well. But the Long Beach story is fascinating. It's a district of about 84,000 students, so it's fairly large, majority Latino, and yet these institutions of higher ed have been able to work with the school superintendent, and his basic attitude is, if it's the right thing to do for students, I'm gonna do it. Oh, it's against state policy? I don't care. <laughs> If it's the right thing to do for students, I'm going to do it. Um, and they've worked this out in terms of the community college teachers and professors sitting down with his teachers and figuring out this seamless system of instruction. Algebra is just one component of it. Now the community college does a couple other interesting things. Um, it doesn't use AccuPlace or a compass. It gives, it places students into credit-bearing classes based on GPA. Now, there's, um, the University of Chicago about five or six years ago started making this argument that GPA was a much better indicator of student success than actually ACT, SAT, AccuPlace, or, or Compass. The only reason that they use AccuPlace or Compass is basically for diagnostic purposes to get students the skills that they're lacking in certain areas as quickly as possible. In other words, so that they don't have to take the entire semester remedial course. They just need to work on the skills. So suppose you're doing that in that wasted senior year, right? And so that students um, are leaving Long Beach ISD knowing that they're going to be placed into credit-bearing courses. The other thing the community college does, and I used to have this argument with Chicago community colleges all the time, because they were very proud of like the 5,000 courses they offered, right? And they had posters and they had brochures up and down, the yin-yang about all the things that they offered. And I said, this is not helpful to Chicago public school students. You guys need to tell them exactly what they're going to be taking, at least for the first semester, right? I mean, because you control, I, I mean, it's great to have individual choice and all that, but you control that, that step into higher education. And these kids need direction in terms of at least that first, that first semester, if not the first year. So Long Beach Community College literally gives Long Beach students no choice. Here are your courses. Here are your professors. This is what you'll be taking. Now, the data at both Cal State Long Beach and at the community college is showing that the kids coming out of Long Beach ISD are outperforming in, at both institutions all the other students that those institutions are admitting. They're outperforming at the community college, the other thousands of kids that are entering. And at Cal State, they're outperforming academically those kids who supposedly have those higher academic skills coming into Cal State Long Beach. It's really an amazing, amazing investment and commitment on a part of in, um, community institutions to, to basically deliver this message, again, district that's largely low income, heavily Latino, 
basically saying there is a future here and we are going to do everything, everything to make sure that you're successful if, if this is the, the pathway that, that you want to go down. All right, um, a couple other thoughts and examples. Um, let me go back to uh, engineering. Detroit. Detroit has a program that starts their engineering sequence with kindergarten students. It's called DAPSA, Detroit Area Pre-Collegiate Engineering Program. One of the unique aspects of this is that, and Chicago just started um, a similar program, is that from kindergarten through third grade, this is not a drop-off program for your student. The parent must attend the sessions with their child. They must attend. If you cannot come with your child to a certain session, your child may not come. The whole purpose here is to not only educate the child, but to educate the parent in terms of the um, disciplines around and supports that they need to give their child and to ingrain those into these mothers and fathers at the earliest point possible. If you go to the University of Michigan's School of Engineering, before you open the door to go into the building, there's a plaque on the building from the university acknowledging their partnership with DAPSEP that's been in existence for 35 years that says, basically, we, we honor our relationship with Detroit Area Pre-Collegiate Engineering Program. This program has produced hundreds of engineers into the automobile industry and thousands of minority um, uh, students into medical, teaching, engineering, STEM fields over the last 35 years. But it's done it in a very realistic way to say if we're really going to do this, we can't start with our juniors in high school. We can't start with our freshmen in high school. We can't start with our 10 year olds. We have to start at the earliest possible point. It's really an amazing um, example, I think. National Science Foundation has been helping to seed this work in Chicago with million dollar grants for each of the last three years. Um, part of it is that the guy who started the Detroit program is actually from Chicago. He retired from Detroit Public Schools uh, a few years ago and I said, Kenneth, you have to come home and you have to do, th do this in Chicago. There's like five or 6,000 kids in DAPSEP every year. Um, he's, he tells a story about how he hopes that the sign-up day, for, which is usually in February, Detroit, can be a little cold. He, he hopes it's the worst day weather-wise um, because he uses it as a way to test the determination of families to get their kids into this program. They have to do the registration at, uh, what is it, uh, where the Pistons play basketball because so many families show up to get their kids in, into this program. And it doesn't cost anything. What he asks them to, all you have to do is deliver your child on, um, this is an after school and Saturday summer program, just deliver your child on time to, to, be, to participate. And by the way, if your kid is four, five, six, seven, or eight years of age, you have to come with them, sort of thing. It's really, it's really quite, quite amazing. Um, all right, let's see, what else can I tell you? You want a, uh, another example of a great uh, partnership between community college, four-year institution, and a school district is, my, is uh, Orlando, Valencia College, and their relationship with Central Florida University and with the Orlando School District, uh, another place to, to, to check out. Um, a great example of where data has, is beginning to bubble up in terms of importance is that 15 states have come together that have state GIRA pro, um, uh, projects, and they basically have partner, are partnering with ACT, and they have agreed to use the EPASS system, so the Explore Plan and ACT test, for all of their GIRA students um, across these 15 states so that they can do some comparative data analysis on some of these outcome measures, like high school graduation rates and post secondary enrollment rates and password completion rates and that, that sort of thing. That's huge from our, from our standpoint at the federal level because we don't have the data, the research to kind of support 
many of the federal investments that are, that are being made. As I mentioned earlier, we put $1.2 billion into Perkins. We put another $1.1 billion a year into Gear Up and TRIO programs. And one of the things that we need better information on is, um, is just what's the added value to these investments. Uh, FAFSA. So I've been talking to some of your state people over the last couple of years to say that um, if you're willing, as some other states have been, to basically push individual verification of your students filing a FAFSA form, um, we would encourage you to consider doing that. Uh, they, they, amongst other states, are concerned about violating FERPA. Um, however, there are three states that for the last several years, the lawyers in these states have said, we don't think this is a FERPA issue um, because we're not revealing any particular piece of information on that student's form. All we're doing is confirming a very simple question, does Johnny have a completed FAFSA form? Yes or no? So states like Colorado, Illinois, Maine, just talked to Massachusetts last Friday, I think they're going to come on board fairly quickly, have said, yeah, we, think, we don't think this is a FERPA violation. And so they have been pushing out to their districts um, once memorandums of understanding have been um, um, signed off on, individual verification, uh, just as three of, three of the districts in the room are participating in the FAFSA completion project, our argument has been, why not do this for every district in your state, sort of thing. So I think where this is going is that eventually there will be guidance um, sent to state officials to say that this is not a FERPA violation. And folks at state levels, the, the people in Illinois and Colorado and Maine have been more than willing to talk to their colleagues around the country. Um, usually it's the state agency that oversees the state scholarship in, in the state and say, here's how we came to our decision and how we became comfortable with um, um, progressing to a point of working with our districts. And what it's doing is exactly what's happening today and what you guys have been involved with um, in your conversations over the last several years particularly um, is building this college going culture both at the at the district level and within each of the buildings and how do we really really build the infrastructure to, to support all, all all this work um, so the FAFSA piece as I've been arguing since I came to the department is really a foot in the door for most districts in terms of being a, the importance of a data point and to hear the 77 percent <laughs> figure is um, is more than important because uh, my own experience in Chicago is Chicago kids it's a 90 percent low-income district those kids are not going on to post-secondary education unless they start with that federal Pell Grant which opens up the door for in, in Illinois' case for $5,000 from the state in addition to the $5,500 from, from us. And so um, their options obviously just get broadened. And yes, we, there's kind of a two-pronged attack here, right? We have to work with our students in terms of building their academic um, uh, rigor and, and abilities and the such, but we also have to give them the realistic opportunity financially to be able to access higher, higher education. Um, so let me see if I have anything else here. Oh, so, um, so about six months ago, I started a monthly call. Ira has been on it, and I want to invite uh, a representative from each of the districts if you, this is of interest. Um, it started out by identifying um, people within school districts that are driving this work. Um, many times it's the counselor, but many times it's not. So districts like Boston, Philadelphia, uh, Miami, um, St. Louis, Chicago, um, rural districts in North Carolina have been hiring um, into a position somewhat around college and career, you know, the college and career executive director, college and career director, uh, Denver, basically to work alongside the school counselors, but to drive this whole college and career going work. 
So um, I started a call about six months ago for an hour. And basically, it's just a way to exchange information and to kind of meet some of your colleagues across the country. Um, we've had people from Harvard who have been doing research on, say, summer melt present. We um, um, have been sh just sharing kind of our own frustrations and opportunities and, and, and the such. So the next call is actually this coming Tuesday. And if you're interested in being part of that, um, just come up to me afterwards or tell Ira and I'll give you my card and I'll make sure you get the call-in number and the such. So there's about, usually about a dozen or so uh, people. Um, the call is set according to my schedule. Um, I'm sorry, but <laughs> it, basically I have to be in the office to actually execute the call. Um, but it's usually at 11 o'clock Eastern time, so 10 o'clock your time and, and the such. And so if you're interested, just, just let me know. But I've been toying with uh, what are some of the other subgroups across the country of folks that, that where you know, some sort of um, interchange might be helpful. The College Board has been, um, has been initiating conversations, certainly with their, with their interest in school counselors and the report I mentioned yesterday, which again I would encourage you to pull down. But the, uh, um, the other is that they took about three months ago a step where they invited people in like Ira to, um, who are not counselors and basically said, so this is Pat Martin, if you know Pat at the College Board who leads their school counseling work, and said, um, tell us how counselors get in the way of you doing your work. Um, they, they, so there were, no other count, there were no counselors in this conversation. It was about 30 people from, from the college access work they, world. And we said, we just want, we want your honest opinion. Ira, what did you say? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, dear. You didn't mean to put you on the spot there, but um, but but I thought it was a really it's one of these courageous conversations, right? Because I know my staff, even though I worked with and oversaw school counselors in Chicago, I also had another part of my team that had nothing that weren't school counselors and who back in the office would, um, I used to describe, God bless you, describe myself, uh, my job as being, you know, one-third administrator and one-third kind of strategist and such, but the other third was being this professional counselor, where, you know, where people come in and they, you close the door and then they just start telling you stuff, like, yeah. <laughs> and you never know where it's going um, as a supervisor. But, so I thought it was a really, really important um, step to begin to honestly engage, you know, what we com what we have is a common goal, but where jealousies and when when we started this work in Chicago for the first two years it was hell, because the school counselors thought I was out there to take their jobs, and it didn't help that the community college had two years before that fired all of their counselors at a board meeting, and those people went to work the next day and didn't have a job. You know, and the Chicago school counselors thought, oh my goodness, the same thing's going to happen to us. This is really just a ploy to, um, ploy to, to get rid of us sort of thing. So we had, we had to work through that, right? And it wasn't a set of e necessarily easy conversations at times to, to, to get to a point where we could collaboratively really, really work together. So I'm thrilled that it's happening at a national level. We'll see where it goes because we are all in this together. And... Well, again, what I love about what's happening here in San Antonio is the, the critical importance of these intermediaries, like the, the educational partnership and Jean's role from the mayor's office and the, um, the P16 council and such. This work doesn't, this work will not progress unless we have, communities have those types of intermediaries who can build the trust across all the different constituencies and, ha and keep the vision alive in terms of what what can what can be accomplished, it just is not happening um, anywhere that I that I know of in the in the country without that sort of vision and support mechanism that can you know call gatherings like this together. This just didn't happen 
because you got an invitation to come today, right? There was a lot, somebody was doing a lot of legwork to, to make these couple days um, a success and, and to keep this, keep this process going, because it's a process, and it's not necessarily a linear process. There's lots of curves and, and backtracking at times and the such, and we just have, and you need leadership with a vision, um, and certainly in your case, having somebody like Mayor Castro, in my case, it was Arnie. It was not the mayor. We brought the mayor along, but it took us about four years because Mayor Daley thought the only jobs Chicago Public School students could barely get would be in the service industry in the hotels in Chicago. And we had to convince him that, no, there is so much potential here with your students, Mayor, and we just had to demonstrate it. One of it, one was through data, but also was through the accomplishments of students and the accomplishments at the school level um, sometimes programmatically, sometimes just by individual student accomplishment um, and the such. So I'll, I'll leave it at that. But again, if um, you're interested in this call, let me know. If you're interested in any of uh, the examples I used, um, all the people that I mentioned are more than interested in connecting with uh, their colleagues across the country. And I've got lots of other examples too that I'm happy to explore with you while I'm, I'll be here the rest, uh, the rest of the day. So, so we have time for questions. We have five or six minutes, okay. Reactions, observations, how do they do that? We can do that. Yes, we can. <laughs> yes, we have to. There's a great group in Salt Lake City, Latinos in Action, started by, it's run now by one of their principals, um, and it's all about building leadership at um, all the way down into the middle grades. Um, heavy focus on high school students. Um, it's, it's heavily connected to their AVID strategy in Salt Lake City. Um, I went to Salt Lake City, not, I've never been there before. They have something like 110 languages in their school district. I was, I was thought of, you know, you see a bunch of white people sort of thing, sorry, but, but, <laughs> it was any, <laughs> but it was anything but. I mean, it was unbelievable, the diversity in Salt Lake City and this huge growing Latino population. And here's this group. They actually have a foothold somewhere here in Texas. Um, they're, 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 I forget what the name of it, the initiative is called, but when, um, we, we actually have a refugee. Yeah, um, that's a, a sanctuary city or, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so that's what Salt Lake City is too, but yeah. yeah. So, anyways, that's um, Somalians and Ethiopians, and yeah, it's it's amazing, really, really exciting. <laughs> I'll have to look it up for you, but I can get it for you. Everyone's stunned. Okay, or you want a break? All right. I'm around. Thank you all. Appreciate it.